Good morning and welcome to Portage Faith United Methodist Church this morning, the last day of January and heading into February. A um, couple of reminders this morning. The Finance Committee will be meeting Tuesday, February 2nd at 6.30 p.m. here in the Fellowship Hall. And right after that meeting, the trustees will be meeting down there at 7 p.m. So finance and trustee committee meetings this Tuesday. And then looking ahead, we have Ash Wednesday coming up February uh, 17th. And there will be a drive-through imposition of ashes. Please um, be on the lookout for more information about that. It's going to be between 9.30 and 12.30 p.m. And uh, we will get some more information to you once that's all worked out. A.M. I'm sorry, 9.30 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. Yeah, okay, all right. And I um, have a couple of birthday wishes to extend today for this week. We have Jeff Kennedy's birthday on the 3rd. Happy birthday, Jeff. We hope that you um, have a great one. And Carrie Pierce is celebrating her birthday on the 4th. And also, Jackson Barnett is um, celebrating on the 4th, so happy birthday to both of you. And last, we have Tim Pierce, who will be celebrating on uh, February 5th. So happy birthday to each and every one of you. And anniversary wishes um, for Doug and Carol McIntosh for the 3rd of February. They will be married 53 years. Congratulations to them, and uh, a round of, of applause for them. Yay, yay, Doug and Carol. All right, and um, on a, seri a more serious note, I have a couple of prayer concerns to lift up to you that I'd like everyone to keep, well, I hope we're all keeping everyone in, in our prayers currently as we are not able to be together and, and knowing exactly what's going on with everybody, but... Here's a couple that we'd really like you to know about. Um, prayers for Tracy Simon and her husband. Tracy is Doris and Jim Pierce's daughter, and she's been diagnosed with um, stage four pancreatic cancer, and that has also traveled to her liver. So we'd like to uh, extend prayers of peace and comfort for Tracy and her husband and for the Pierce family. And um, Pastor Jill is on the mend, but we would like, please, continued prayers for her mending and for relief from pain as she has experienced bad reaction to the OxyContin and other pain pills are just not doing the job for her. So please keep her in your extended prayers. That's it, thank you. Let's join together in the call to worship. Praise God, who loves us all. Praise, Praise God, God, who is full of mercy and compassion. Praise God, who loves us well. Praise, Praise God, God, who creates honesty and justice. Praise God, who invites us to love. Praise, Praise God, God, who loves through us and our actions. Our Light of Christ reading this morning is from Psalm 111. Praise the Lord. I will extol the Lord with all my heart in the counsel of the upright and in the assembly. Great are the works of the Lord. They are pondered by all who delight in them. Glorious and majestic are his deeds and his righteousness endures forever. He has caused his wonders to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and compassionate. He provides food for those who fear him. He remembers his covenant forever. He has shown his people the power of his works, giving them the lands of other nations. The works of his hands are faithful and just, and his precepts are trustworthy. They are steadfast forever and ever, done in faithfulness and uprightness. 
He provided redemption for his people. He ordained his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and who follow his precepts have good understanding. To him belongs eternal praise. And please join me now in our opening prayer. Loving God, love through us as we worship your holy name. Love through us as we live your teachings and offer your love to the world. In your majestic name we pray, amen. seasons. We thank you for the quietness of these mid midwinter days with their long evenings. If winter brings to any a bit of disease and depression, we ask that you would provide light and hope. May we use these days well. We thank you that they give us the opportunity to ponder the pattern of our lives and how it's been woven into your story as we reflect in this season. Are our lives going in the direction that is providing us meaning and fulfillment? If not, help us to take corrective action and to change. Are we using our time in ways that are satisfying? 
If not, help us to take corrective action and to change. Are we finding ways to grow in our spiritual journey and to grow more gracious spirits? If not, help us to take corrective action and to change. Are we growing in our ability to learn tolerance, to be appreciative of the diversity of the peoples you have put on your earth, to overcome our past prejudices? If not, help us to take corrective action and to change. Are we gaining on some of the more elusive virtues such as humility, generosity, and the ability to provide blessing and affirmation for others? If not, help us to take corrective action and to change? Are we more embedded within our Christian community, walking hand in hand with our sisters and brothers in the faith? If not, help us to take corrective action and to change. Are we hopeful people with an attitude to believe that we can overcome the world? If not, help us to take corrective action. O oh God, help us to use these long winter days wisely as we continue to pray the prayer that your Son, Jesus Christ, taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I invite us now to confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. <coughs> Thank you. 
our scripture lesson this morning is from Mark 1, verses 21 through 28. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. Just then, a man in their synagogue who was possessed by an evil spirit cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, said Jesus sternly. Come out of him. The evil spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. The people were all so amazed that they asked each other, What is this? A new teaching and with authority. He gives orders to evil spirits and they obey him. News about him spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I can still hear the tone of Bishop James Thomas's lyrical and eloquent voice. Take authority to preach the word of God and to serve all God's people. It's been 35 years, and I can still close my eyes and hear that voice, as I've done for years over the course of ministry. The sound of those spoken words with the gentle touch of hands laid on me still resonates within me. Those words celebrate who I am and who God has called me to be. They are words that connect ministry with baptism. I do what I do as a beloved child of God. In today's story from the Gospel of Mark, Jesus, accompanied by those first four disciples that we talked about last week, enters the town of Capernaum and teaches in the synagogue on the Sabbath. We don't know the stories or the lessons that Jesus shares in his teaching, but we know that his teaching provokes a reaction in the congregation. Mark says, the people were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority, not as a scribe. Jesus teaches as one with authority. Authority is a double-edged word in Scripture. In the Greek, the very same word dunamis can be translated as power or as authority. It's the root word behind our familiar words dynamic and dynamite. We know that authority, when it's enforced with power or consequence, can be coercive. Do what I say, or else. Might makes right. But Jesus' authority is not coercive. The power of Jesus' authority comes from the truth and the directness of his teaching. We might call Jesus a dynamic teacher. Or we might call Jesus even a dynamite teacher because of the way he transfixes his audience. Jesus captures the rapt attention of his audience even as he makes them uncomfortable. 
His teaching is at the same time exciting and challenging to those who hear him. At the same time, his teaching makes people's ears burn and captures their imagination. As a teacher, Jesus leaves people buzzing with curiosity, and at times he leaves people open-mouthed and incredulous. In Jesus, people are listening to a teacher who gives them a new understanding of themselves. What just happened to us? Is this a new kind of teaching? Jesus' teaching shakes up people. Now, when we think back to the best teachers who have come into our lives, we rarely remember the specific content that they taught us. We don't remember those equations or the Spanish or the human physiology that they drilled into us. But we do remember them as an exceptional teacher, as exceptional people. They are passionate about teaching. They demand the best from us as students. They care for us as people. The truth matters to them. Well, as the TV ad says, but wait, there's more. You and I can probably remember a few worship services that were memorable because of unplanned things that happened in them. I remember helping an older woman sitting right beside me in the pew on a Sunday morning slip a nitro tab under her tongue before she passed out, creating enough commotion that the pastor stopped his sermon and asked, is everything all right? I served one church that had a favorite story about a choir member who pulled a live blackbird out of one of the organ pipes during a worship service and took it outside and released it. And I remember sitting in a congregation when someone's hearing aid started screeching, that shrieking sound, electronic sound. Of course, the person with the hearing aid couldn't hear it. But you know, I've never experienced an exorcism in the middle of church. I've been with people as they experience mental breakdowns, and I've been frightened by people as they go ballistic. But I've never been in church when someone comes in flailing their arms, screaming and disturbed, and puts themselves right in the center of the worship service. This is more than a memorable distraction, more than a sideshow in Mark's gospel. Casting out the demon from the man with the unclean spirit was the main event on that Sabbath in Capernaum. The congregation was amazed at Jesus's astonishing response. Jesus cast out a demon in the middle of church. It's really a difficult story to make sense of. And the truth is, I wish it were not in today's gospel, but it is. One writer I read called it a used-to-think story, 
Like we used to think the world was flat, or we used to think the sun traveled across the sky. We used to think that there were all kinds of little demons running around causing diseases that we now attribute to viruses, bacteria, genetics, trauma, hormonal imbalances. But I encourage us not to dismiss the story of the man with the unclean spirit or to explain it away. You see, in Mark's gospel, preaching, teaching, casting out demons, and healing are intertwined in stories of Jesus. All the parts of Jesus' ministry are necessary to reveal who he is. Casting out demons is inseparable from teaching, preaching, and healing. Call it comprehensive authority, if you want. Call it Emmanuel. It's all mashed together in the same ball of wax. And by the way, the demons always seem to recognize who Jesus is, even when Jesus' followers do not. This is the pattern of Jesus' ministry according to Mark, and it gets repeated over and over again, preaching, teaching, healing, casting out demons, all define Jesus' ministry. Jesus even authorizes his disciples to exercise demons. Do you think performing your first exorcism as a rookie disciple would be a little unnerving? I think so. Casting out demons along with preaching and healing the sick is the work that Jesus gives his followers to do. We can't say, oh Jesus, I wish you wouldn't do that. So what do we make of this? What do we make of this story of Jesus casting out the demon of the man with the unclean spirit? What's going on? Well, one way to handle it is like the scribes did. The scribes kept notes of every out-of-the-box move that Jesus made. And like every congregation, the synagogue had unwritten rules. There were expectations about what you say and what you, the way you act in church. When people step into the sanctuary, they're supposed to know without being reminded what's appropriate and what's inappropriate to do or to say. And some saw the situation as deviant behavior that day in the synagogue in Capernaum. We don't do this in church. This shouldn't happen here. You're a rule breaker, Jesus, and we are here to keep track of how many times <coughs> you break the rules. We're building a case against you. That's one way to understand the story. Or we can admit that we all have our own demons to wrestle with. They may not make us scream or cause us to lose physical control, though they can, but there are plenty of destructive demons out there in the world. These demons are the internal voices and the external forces that coerce us with their power. Jealousy, addictions, self-righteousness, unhealthy lifestyles, anxiety, grief, unforgiving spirits. 
As one writer puts it, when relentless internal voices undermine our sense of belovedness, when we feel flawed, untouchable, and unworthy, when we feel like failures, how do we return to the truth that we are thoroughly loved by the God who beholds us with compassion and care? Well, some people in Capernaum 2,000 years ago saw and experienced a liberation event. Jesus responding to a situation in church that needed God's attention. Jesus did what God would do. That's another way to see the story of casting out an unclean spirit. Emerging from the cleansing waters, Jesus encountered God saying, You are my son, my beloved, in whom I take great delight. In the eyes of the God Jesus knew, we are all sons and daughters of the divine. We are all beloved. And we are all held in the sacred radiance that delights in our beauty and giftedness. Preaching, teaching, healing, casting out demons are inseparable parts of Jesus' authority. Jesus demonstrates the full spectrum of God's love. We need to know that God has the authority to cast out the demons that trouble us and return our God-given identity as beloved daughters and sons. So that with all the saints, we learn what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth of God's love and we are filled with the fullness of God. Look, a lifetime is the time that God gives us, each one of us, however long it happens to be to become who we are truly created to be. We worship the one who has comprehensive authority to cast the demons out once and for all. Against great odds, unproven conspiracy theories, sinister death plots, Jesus kept on preaching, teaching, casting out demons, and healing the sick. It led him to the cross. Jesus wants us to be free of the influences that steer and coerce us to be other than we truly are. Jesus offers us the authority to live our lives close to God. As Charles Wesley puts it, he breaks the power of canceled sin. He, he sets the prisoner free. Amen. Glorious God, even as we belong to you, we are loved by you. In this love, we are transformed into new creations again and again. With this love, we are given power and opportunity to transform others with acts of love and grace. 
love through us, even as we are loved, that your world may grow even closer to you, and that we may grow even closer to your likeness. Amen. of grace and love, let us respond by offering our gifts and our lives to God. We give thanks for you sending your tithes and your offerings and your gifts to the congregation by mail, by drop-off at the church on Wednesday, on weekday mornings, <laughs> or by giving online. Let us pray. Holy, awesome God, we bring gifts of paper and coin, symbols of our gratitude and our love. Bless these symbols, that they may become acts of love and grace. Bless us and our gifts, that we may transform the world with love and grace in gratitude and in hope we pray amen
these words of blessing. Go now to love as beloved children of God. Go now to live as living signs of Christ's presence. Go now to transform the world with the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>